Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, welcoming you to the Top 10 Auto Show. This week, we continue our roundup of the Top 10 vehicles from the main categories of the motor world, as voted by our panel of editors from the UK's top motoring magazines. This week, we take a look at the cars usually found in the reserved spaces in the staff car park as we count down the top 10 executive cars of 2001. So, to start with, at number 10 is the Vauxhall Omega. The styling of this Vauxhall has never been one of its greatest strengths. The Amiga's rather bland and wishy-washy outer shell, plus a lacklustre interior, really tells the occupants what it is. A cut-price executive car. But we've come here to praise Caesar, not to bury him. It's actually a very comfortable car to travel in, and the revisions in 1999 have certainly made the cabin a fairly classy place to sit in. Now, moving inside, again, it's an all-new interior. Vauxhall have tried to create, well, a touch of luxury, and I think they've pretty much succeeded. The dashboard has a soft-touch feel to it. There's a new centre console with heating and ventilation controls and a brand-new stereo system, too. Now, Vauxhall, like most manufacturers, are incorporating a satellite navigation system into the car, and you can have the option of a 5-inch television monitor screen right there, giving you the sat-nav. There's plenty of space for passengers and some handy storage bins too. The performance of the base model is nothing to write home about either, and it certainly can't match anything from the other German manufacturers. The other? Of course! The Amiga is actually manufactured in Germany. Don't tell me you thought it was made in Luton. It has to be said that the Amiga was always a decent car to drive. Rear wheel drive, a decent chassis and setup. And if you pick the 3 litre V6, well, a real stormer of an engine. 211 brake horsepower on tap and very respectable 0 to 60 times of just over 8 seconds, top speed of 150 miles an hour. The 3 litre V6, of course, continues into the new range in either Elite or MV6 form. This is the MV6, and this, in my opinion, is the pick of the bunch. It gets a lowered sport suspension by 15 millimetres, stiffer ride, a touch anyway, and unique alloy wheels and an aluminium dashboard. Depreciation on the Amiga is high. If you're going to buy new and keep it forever, then fine, but this is never going to be the case, is it? Let someone else take the early financial knock and buy used, say two or three years old, number 10 in our chart of executive cars, the Vauxhall Amiga. In at number 9, the Peugeot 607. At first glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking the 607 is just a bigger 406, but a double take shows that it is, of course, something quite different. Once you're inside the 607, there is no doubt that it is a genuine contender for the executive class. It has everything you'd expect and stands very favourable comparison with the interiors of the BMWs and, in fact, the Mercedes. What I particularly like about it is how well the leather and the wood blends together. It looks very natural. It's very warm and inviting. The engine range includes a 2.2 litre petrol, a 2.2 litre HDI and a 3 litre V6. So far, the 2.2 litre petrol engine has been the biggest seller, although it does seem rather underpowered if you're really going to drive the 607 hard. And drivability? Well, the development of the suspension and handling hasn't been an easy ride. Bad puns aside, Peugeot were forced to go back and do some fine-tuning after being blasted by the French press. But on the snow and ice, our Ken Gibson has found plenty to praise, mainly the electronic stability control. I really have to say this ESP is the business. I'm driving on what can be only described as sheet ice with a covering of snow and it's handling remarkably. It's only when you really push it that you can feel the back end go and then it gets corrected again by the system. 
This is a really practical, genuine benefit to the ordinary driver. Value is the real stumbling block of this brave new department for Peugeot. They make excellent value small cars that hold the value well. However, the executive class is a different ball game altogether. So we'll just have to wait and see if the depreciation of the Peugeot 607 is as bad as some pundits predict. In at number eight is the first German car in our executive lineup, the Audi A6. The Audi A6 is a hugely practical car. It has solid construction, big doors to get in and out of, plus both saloon and avant have enormous load carrying abilities. Inside you'll enjoy really comfortable seating and well thought out ergonomics, which all add up to the positive experience. And Richard Hammond seems to like it too. And it's got everything you could possibly need for middle management, middle lane credibility. Prestige badge at the front, Audi, very respectable. Alloy wheels, flash. And most importantly of all, a seriously big number on the tailgate. 4.2 litres. It's a V8 no less. 300 brake horsepower. Thank you very much, Mr. Fleet Car Manager. Have a round of golf on me. Very nice, Richard. But you'll pay through the nose in taxes for a company car like that. Not the best way to lure the executive. Something that Audi must have had in mind when they fitted their newly revised A6 with a range of nine different engines, which means there should be one to suit the corporate pocket and even the most lowly of lower management. But it's not just under the bonnet that they've made changes. Just because it's a company car doesn't mean it doesn't have to look pretty. In the style department, the A6 doesn't really make a bold statement, but that's what many of its fans want. This car's styling is perfect for those who want to enjoy all the prestige that the A6 offers without having to brag to the whole street about it. However, impeccable build quality, luxurious cruising, generous equipment levels, competitive prices and excellent residual values make the Audi A6 an impressive executive all-rounder. Number 8 in our chart of executive cars, the Audi A6. At number 7 is another German offering, the Mercedes E-Class. The Mercedes E-Class is seen as a safe option for many, but maybe too safe. The image is the problem here, as the Mercedes brand has often been seen as an old person's car. Sure, they've tried their best to appeal to new young folk, but in the end, you get a solid Mercedes with no nonsense practicalities. Despite having enough attitude to walk straight onto the set of the latest gangster flick, it's still very much a Mercedes. It feels kind of sensible somewhere. The view down the huge bonnet the size of a playing field, at the end of which is the little three-pointy star, like a target, sweeping across the horizon. This is actually enormous fun to drive. I don't get it, I don't see why you need it, but it's huge fun. When it comes to the interior of the Mercedes, well, in a car that costs money more familiar in an estate agency, you'd expect something a bit more special. It is terminally bland, though I suspect it will last incredibly well. So when it comes to value for money, even though the car may seem expensive, as an investment it actually makes a very sensible choice. That's what you tell the bank manager anyway. At number six, we find an old English classic, owned by the Americans, shh. It's the Jaguar S-Type. The first thing that strikes you about the S-Type is its looks. Styling can be described by one word, retro. Now you may remember that when the S-Type was launched, Jaguar wanted to recreate a lot of that style of the 60s. And with those twin headlamps, the Mark II style grille and the copious curves, it certainly looks more retro than cutting edge. Some people feel a little let down by the new small Jaguar, it's certainly no rival for the BMW 5 Series as a driving machine out on the road, and it's not big enough to be a traditional limo. However, 
The Jaguar S-Type has been hugely successful for the company. And although it's not an obvious practical choice for the executive with the family, it is an excellent mode of transport to whisk the manager and his colleagues with their golf clubs in the back for a very upmarket weekend away. Believe it or not, it's actually the interior of the S-Type that surprised me most. I was expecting something more like a Jag XJ, but instead, well, set your sights more like a Mondeo gear. It feels all right, it's reasonable quality, but the colours, it's so dark and this nasty walnut trim, this is definitely geared for the American market. And Jaguar are the first to admit that it needs a change. In fact, it is due for a facelift. But who really cares about all this? What the majority of buyers want from a Jaguar is the badge on the front of the car, and this car's got one. Number six in our chart of executive cars, the Jag S-Type. At number 5 is the only Japanese car in the executive top 10, the Lexus GS300. 25 years ago, no one would believe that any Japanese car would be considered an executive class, especially since German cars seem to have ruled the roost in this category since time began. However, the mid-sized Lexus, the GS300, puts a convincing case forward. The new version retains much of the look of the original, but it's under the skin where you'll find most of the improvements. Well, we've got everything in here that we need straight away. We've got plenty of wood and acres and acres of leather. We've also got loads of buttons that would indicate we've got plenty of kit and the sexiest sat-nav setup I've ever seen on any production car, I reckon. There's no doubt as well it's got the usual incredibly high standard of fit and finish we'd expect in a Lexus. The only downside is, like a lot of the girls I used to date, oddly enough, the one thing it is lacking is any kind of passion. Once you get the thing rolling, the first thing you notice is the first thing you don't notice. Noise. There isn't any. In fact, if it wasn't for the rather garish rev canter showing a measly few hundred revs, you wouldn't know you were running at all. You might be rolling. An impressive package the Lexus GS300 may be, we feel that the list price is not great value. Unless you can get an excellent discount, which is unlikely, you'll be mightily shocked by the depreciation over a couple of years, and those fuel bills are not going to be small. However, if you don't want to be seen as just following the pack, the Lexus is a very credible alternative in the executive car sector. Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, welcoming you to the Top 10 Auto Show. This week, the Top 10 Executive Cars of 2001. At number 4, we have the car from the Swedish makers of jet fighters. It is the Saab 95. Once upon a time, the Saab car company were quite content in bringing out unusual left-field cars. Since the takeover by General Motors, however, the company has had to launch cars that are more commercially viable. The result? The 95 has been a remarkable success for Saab. Even though the 95 is an all-new car, it does look remarkably like the outgoing 9000 series. But for the real Saab fan, there is the cockpit, which must take inspiration from their aircraft. With the instruments banked in front of you, you feel very much like you're in control of an aircraft. And one other typical Saab feature as well, the ignition key mounted down here on the transmission tunnel. They've always done it, and it looks like they always will. It does mean you can lock the gearbox as well. The performance of the Saab 95 is excellent. It may not be quite as sporty as some of the competition, but you feel that the engine under the bonnet will really do the business out on the open road. And don't forget, there's also Saab's legendary turbocharger. The best way to enjoy your 95 is to sit back, calm and unruffled. Think club class again on a long intercontinental flight. Just reserve that acceleration for takeoff and maybe a bit of overtaking. But be warned, when you do come to land, you might find the brakes are a bit of a surprise. It's not that they're not there, they are but you will have to give the pedal a bit of a prop. Most Saabs tend to keep their value well over the years, but if you fall in love with the Saab 95, you may want to keep it for years and years and years. At number three from Italy, 
the Alfa Romeo 166. When considering buying an Alfa Romeo, there's one overriding factor that eclipses all others. But look beyond the badge and you'll notice something else about the 166. It's big. It actually feels comfortably sized as well. It doesn't feel tinny and small. You feel you're in something substantial and solid with plenty of road presence. The Alfa Romeo 166 offers a rare touch of flair in the lineup with other rather sober looking executive cruisers. Just like a Mickey Mouse tie in a stuffy boardroom, the 166's stylish Italian design cheers you up just by looking at it. On the road, the Alpha 166 carries you along in hushed luxury until you put your foot down. Then the distinctive Alpha roar and the great acceleration reminds you that this is much more than just a motorway cruiser. And also it's not short of go. Because it certainly isn't underpowered. This particular version has a 3-litre V6, which apart from sounding glorious, which it does, it also provides plenty of oomph right through the rev range, wherever you are in whatever gear, there's always power to hand. Oh, and talking about the gears, we've got six of them. They're not the slickest operating thing in the world, but they ain't bad. We think that the high level of standard equipment makes the 166 excellent value for money and compensates for the steeper depreciation than some of its German counterparts can enjoy. And so to the runner-up in our top 10, at number 2, the Volvo S80. When the Volvo S80 was first released on the unsuspecting world, we then realized that this was the shape of things to come. The bigger shock was that this was only going to be a saloon, no estate, from the company which was famous for them. Absolutely! For Volvo, the S80 was going to show the world that this was how they would build an executive car for the 21st century. Although not as engaging as, say, the Saab 95, or as exhilarating as the BMW 5 Series, the S80 offers a very different sort of driving experience. In fact, you'd be surprised what this Volvo can do. Now, if the engine in the Jag was respectable Middle England, well, this thing has got a nutty Swede under the bonnet. Again, it's a V6, but this time it's turbocharged, giving you 270 brake horsepower, and that <laughs> acceleration is ridiculous it'll get you to 60 in a shade over seven seconds and that's a figure that most sports cars would be proud of if you were put off by the firm ride that others in this class needed to have to offer a sporty driving experience then the volvo has been designed for you the handling is good and the 2.4 se provides adequate performance plus the s80 is bristling with equipment this makes the car a pretty good buy however Volvo has been obsessed with giving potential purchasers choices in so many areas that second-hand cars in all different colors and trims are difficult to price. But maybe when it settles down, this car will get a strong resale value like its German counterparts. So, let's run down the top 10 executive cars of 2001 so far from 10 to 2. Down at number 10, bland outside, comfy in, the Vauxhall Amiga. In at number 9, no, it's not the 406, it's the Peugeot 607. Motoring in at number 8, it has everything but not enough to get any higher, the Audi A6. And at number 7, the safe option, the Mercedes E-Class. At number 6, the English classic with American owners, the Jaguar S-Type. Midway at number 5, the only Japanese car in the running, the Lexus GS300. Flying in at number 4, they make planes and cars you'll want to keep for years, Saab's 95. Getting close to the top spot at number 3, the Alpha 166. Almost there at number 2, built like a tank, goes like a rocket, the Volvo S80. And so, to the number 1 executive car of 2001, as voted for by a panel of editors of the UK's top car magazines. It is the one and only BMW 5 Series. The 5 Series awards cabinet must be very full at the moment as it's won so many awards over the years. In practical terms, the car will give you a large family vehicle that will keep the driver very happy as well. 
He or she will be happy with the executive cabin, the levels of comfort, as well as the 5 Series world-renowned driving abilities. BMW have ensured that the car has been continuously revised regularly to keep ahead of the pack. Maybe there could be an inch or two more space in the rear passenger area, but overall, it's a highly impressive practical package. Basically, the only base version, base version is the SE, on which you get pretty much everything. Electric seats, air conditioning, all that kind of stuff. Costs you about 35,140. To spec it up to this, the Sport, it's gained the M-type suspension and huge alloy wheels, a nice fancy steering wheel, few body styling details, another two and a half grand, thank you very much, taking it to a total of 37,640 quid. To some designer gurus, BMW have lost their way in the styling department. To others, their cars are leading the way that the others will follow. The critics argue that the traditional kidney grille and the chrome trim is a little dated and the dash is on the cluttered side. The rest of the interior is rather sober but practical and ergonomic. We score it highly here. Full marks for the 5 Series with its performance and recent refinements and tweaks which have improved output in both power and emissions. Of course, we'd all like to buy the top of the range, stunning M5 model, offering 0 to 60 in about 5 seconds, but at a price of £52,000, it's probably a bit out of our reach. So, congratulations to BMW with the number one slot for this year's series. This has been Dave Lee Travis saying thanks for watching and we'll see you next week for the top 10 mid-sized estates. See you then.